right. Welcome back to the Club Innovators Podcast. As always, I have Greg Rotzel and Tyler Vandermullen with me. And today we're going to talk about assessing your sales process. We're going to cover the entire sales process and we're going to dive into assessing your salesperson as well. So gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming back on. And I'm excited to have you once again. Excited to be here, Kyle. Kyle. Thanks for hosting me. Oh man, I love when you guys always take a long time to respond. So let's pop back into it, assessing the sales process. You know, Tyler, we had a, a quick chat about this the other day and we wrote down some points that we're going to go through in this episode. And the first one we talked about is when is the last time a club has had an honest assessment of themselves? And when we talk about that honest assessment, what all goes into that, Tyler? Yeah, I just even to take just one further step back, Kyle, when we first started talking about this topic, I think it's just one of those ones that, you know, as I engage with clubs uh, routinely throughout my my work week, it's kind of amazing to me that so many clubs don't have an answer for how often or how recently they have, have even completed a club assessment of their sales process. So, you know, that in itself um, is one thing. It's a little concerning and alarming, quite frankly, um, that, you know, again, kind of as a whole, when things are going well, when a, God forbid, once in a lifetime thing like COVID helps boom clubs, you know, they, it's not that they fall asleep at the wheel, but it's that they're not quite maximizing every single opportunity that they have. Um, so very interesting, uh, exciting topic. Very excited to talk with you guys about that a little bit uh, greater length on, again, what does that look like? What do you need to be doing when you take an actual look at your assessment, your salesperson? Uh, and what are some easy ways you can clean things up and, and improve upon those? Yeah, you make a great point. Um, like most areas of business, people typically do a review on maybe how the last year went or trends over the years. So when you talk about making an honest assessment, it makes sense maybe annually at least to go back through and see what the lead sources were and see what the close rate is and, and see you know the process as a whole and to be able to judge it, right? If you never really review it, you never know how well you're doing on it. So that, that makes a great point. Um, now, earlier last year, uh, we did this a couple of times. We went out, we secret shopped some clubs. Um, I know we want to talk a little bit about that, Tyler. So do you kind of want to open up and talk about what the secret shop was and kind of what some of our data revealed? Yeah. So, you know, again, a, a, a key process that I would encourage any club owner, operator, general manager out there to do is secret shop your own person, secret shop your own club. Um, you know, easiest way to do that is just submit an inquiry on the website uh, and gather that data. Um, we do that <laughs> unbelievably regularly, um, both in new markets that we go into, as well as for our own salespeople. And it's always revealing. Um, you know, to talk a little bit about some of those key data points that we looked at, you know, we were looking at clubs that ranged from anywhere from a 2500 all the way up to a $125,000 initiation fee. So this is all encompassing of every style of private club out there. Um, every, we pick clubs from all 50 states. And again, we submit that inquiry and then just kind of wait to see what their process is. Um, you know, again, with that, 25% of the clubs who are secret shopping don't even respond to the inquiry. Not even an automated email, no phone call, no, no I mean, no email, no, 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 anything, no effort whatsoever. Um, and so quick question, just interjecting there. Do 25% of clubs happen to be on wait lists or anything like that? Is there any reason why they wouldn't reply? I mean, there's always the outlier clubs that are truly by invite only. For the most part, those clubs don't even have an inquiry spot on their website. So, you know, I have a hard time believing that it should be anywhere <laughs> remotely close to that large of a uh, junk of the clubs that we're inquiring with are not responding at all. Um, yeah. And I guess they wouldn't have been in the study if they didn't have a website inquiry. Cause that's how we contacted them. Correct. That's right. Yeah. So again, I think it goes back to the complacency. Um, you know, COVID was a great thing for the private club industry as a whole, but what it did was made a lot of membership sales directors comfortable with the, uh, you know, they're going to have to come chase me down and come, you know, check in hand, ready to sign up. When that is, you know, for those who have been doing this for long enough, that is not the norm in this industry. It, they still need to be taken through a very formal sales process. You still need to have outbound lead generators. You can't just rely on someone inquiring on the website. And, you know, God forbid if that sales director doesn't call them back right away, you know, they're going to come in and see me. Um, you are literally leaving the lowest of hanging fruit just sitting there. So, uh, so that was one point. Um, only 8% of clubs that did make contact with us after we inquired had an additional contact point after that in terms of a follow-up. Um, again, 
a, a jarring figure that, you know, <laughs> hey, you inquired, here's here's what you need from me. And again, if you're interested in joining, you you, you contact me. Um, completely backward. 38% uh, of the clubs we spoke with reached out to us within two hours. Um, so that is, of the clubs that did respond, that's pretty impressive. Um, we've got a hard 24-hour rule that we implement across all of our uh, membership sales directors. A um, few other data points we looked at was what was their uh, primary method of response? Were they picking up the phone and calling us or were they just sending an automated email? It's yeah, pretty- I think this is a big piece, right? Because we're big preachers of, and, and Greg, you can kind of probably interject here because you deal with this a lot more, but we're we're big on preaching, you know, pick up the phone and call. And there's a reason for that. Why, you know, why is that such a big piece of what we do, Greg? Yeah, I mean, it it's it's a sales position right but it's it's a position where you want to create a relationship you want to build rapport with every single prospect that you're talking to with with every single person that is potentially interested in membership um so if all you are doing is just emailing them and you're just writing words down through an email and that's (laughs) it i'm sorry but it's going to be very difficult to build that rapport and create that relationship right i mean as as a membership director, um, I've, I've worked at a bunch of different clubs um, and sold for, for a lot of clubs. And my really my biggest, my biggest point that I made every single time was I'm going to reach out to this person right away. I'm going to give them a call. I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to learn about them. I'm going to learn about their interests. I'm going to learn about their family. I'm going to learn about what they do for a living and and talk about myself as well, right? And create that relationship. And that is going to get the prospects a lot more comfortable with, with you as a salesperson, but also with the club. They're talking to you and you are an extension of the club. So if they feel comfortable with you as the membership sales director, they're naturally going to feel more comfortable with the club. They're gonna to wanna to come out for a tour. Um, they're going to want to meet other other members at the club. They're going to want to meet the staff at the club as well. So everything kind of funnels into each step in the process. But if you are just shooting out an email and leaving it there, you're missing out on <laughs> way too much, just way too much. <laughs> yeah, that's such a relevant point. You can learn a lot more from talking with somebody for five minutes than you can and probably 10 emails. So it's a great point there. Tyler, kicking back to some of those stats, were there any other ones that were kind of, you know, big outliers that we were looking at? Yeah, I think the the last one um, that was just, again, big for me. So 95% of those clubs chose email as their primary uh, method to contact. So of the clubs that did respond, 95% are sending some form or fashion of an email. You can tell pretty quickly which ones are actually customized and uh, tailored specifically, and then you can very easily tell which ones are legitimately an automated email. Um, with a different font style for your name or, you know, not, again, you could very, very quickly tell those differences. <laughs> the last one that I'll note um, through the secret shop data that we've collected so far, uh, 86% of clubs disclose pricing on their first contact. Again, I, I think we all have some philosophies and mentalities on when pricing should be detailed and in what form or fashion. Um, I know we have a very specific way we train our salespeople on if we're going to give price, that's okay. But there are some things that we need to get in return from them. But for 86% of their clubs to be, again, sending emails, 95% of the content we got was from emails and 86 of those are with pricing. That takes the salesperson directly out of the process. Again, yeah. if I've experienced your club once as a guest, I just got an email now from you after I inquired online and it gives me all the pricing. What do I need to reach out to the sales director for? They can't convince me that you know, there's so much information and opportunity that's not taken advantage of when you're sending an email that includes the pricing. So same reason a club should never have their price on their website to begin with. You need to be taken through a formal process. You need to find out, obviously, and, and the club also needs to view it as we need to make sure this is a good person for the club, right? There's that, that kind of harmonious need of let's make sure it's a good fit for this prospective family. And let's also make sure it's a good fit for the club. Yeah. I, and that's, again, just such important points when we're talking about this and going through all these pieces. There's a reason why we do the secret shop. And, you know, knowing our company, we, we also secret shop our own employees, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we we get some really bright people that come in and we train them and we you know staff them out at a, a client club. And 
um, trust that they're doing all the right things. As we've talked about in other episodes, our CRM system is a great tool to be able to identify you know, kind of what they're doing on a day in and day out and kind of those breaks in the chain or areas for continued, uh, continued improvement. But, you know, secret shopping is, again, such a simple way to find out, are they following the course of what we train them on? The foundational steps of being a good sales director. Are they reaching out within yeah. 24 hours? Are they doing it via phone? Are they asking the right questions to find out how familiar I am with the club? You know, again, starting that out on the right way. And if they're not, then obviously that, that leads to a little bit more of a difficult conversation, but it's important to, to have. Yeah. And it's an important piece, right? Obviously we practice what we preach, but we want to understand that sales process and make sure we're following that, that process that we lay out for everyone. So I, uh, you know, the other piece kind of getting back to some of those questions about the assessment, um, you know, we talked about, you know, looking at strengths and weaknesses of, of a club and, and things of that nature. You know, can you talk a little more about that, Tyler? Uh, so when you talk about strengths and areas of opportunity, when you're completing a secret shop, you know, one of the things that's going to stand out very quickly is what are they doing well? Is the response time really good? Are they doing a great job of building rapport? So again, it can give you some confidence of, okay, you've got the right salesperson. They're doing some, you know, some of the foundational things really well. But what's also going to be glaring a lot of the time is some of the things that you can clean up, some of the things you can improve. Is your salesperson including pricing on that very first contact? Um, are they not asking questions to find out how qualified they are, what they do for a living? Are they new to the area? Um, things that, again, just kind of help you create that rapport that like Greg was mentioning. Um, yeah. and then again, other things like, are they, you know, as you go through that process even further, uh, and you're really looking at the sales opportunities and obviously it helps having a really good CRM system with that. Uh, but you know, where can they tighten up their sales process? Are they getting a lot of people out to the club that are taking good tours that aren't joining? And are you collecting real data points as to why they're not joining? Um, just again, ways to constantly improve. I think even the top sales directors out there at the top 100 clubs, would all agree there's always room for improvement in their process. So, you know, when you can go through and regularly have that assessment of your salesperson, your sales process, uh, and be very objective of what's working, what's not working, again, there's there's always room for improvement. Yeah. So you mentioned data there. When you're assessing the sales process or a salesperson, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of data that goes into it, but can you give us some examples of some of those data points that you want to pull to to do this assessment? Yeah, I'll uh, I'll I'll dive in on that one. Um, and and honestly, piggybacking on what Tyler was saying, you know, we've been talking about the the secret shop, right? Both other clubs, but also our own salespeople, um, just to see yeah. what their initial process is like, to see how quickly they reach out, to see uh, the the conversation that they have right off the bat, and and make sure that it is as it should be, right? Um, but there is also the the other side of it where we are obviously working very closely with our salespeople and we can see everything that they're doing within our CRM system. Um, so as managers, we can go in and we can go back through all the different prospects and leads that have come in over the past couple months, over the past couple weeks, um, and look into what their process has been, what the ongoing process is, right? Because it, with secret shopping, a lot of times you see just the initial process and the outreach right off the bat, but you also want to see how things are moving along through a sales process. Um, you want to see how much follow-up there is from those salespeople. You want to see the types of emails that they're sending and the verbiage and language that is is being sent out to prospects. And it should match up with what we what we normally do, what we want to see on our end. Um, so I think that is also very important there. There's multiple aspects of, uh, of secret shopping and, uh, assessing a sales process, but we go back with all of our managers regularly through all of our salespeople and go back to, to new prospects that have inquired over usually about the, the last month or so. And we take a, an honest assessment of what was the outreach like, how much rapport did they build? What, what did the language look like in their emails? What was the follow-up like? Um, how many times did they reach out to this person and, and what have they been saying? Um, and we will, we will rate, you know, our salespeople from, from one to 10. Um, and it, the, the key I think is one, having salespeople that always want to get better, right? They are always striving to be the best that they can be. Um, that is, that, that is a big part of it. Um, 
because if you can go through the sales process, you can do secret shopping and then you can talk to them and have that constructive criticism if needed, right? If there's a little bit of a tweak that is needed in their process um, and then boom, they make that difference and that can, that can change things uh, right off the bat. Um, so I know that was a bit of a long answer and, and your question was about no. something slightly different. But but also getting into it when when you're assessing the sales process throughout the CRM system, um, there is the data side of it, right? There are there is specific data that we look at. We always look at lead to tour ratios. We always look at tour to close ratios, or we just look at straight a number of new leads coming in as as compared to sales, right? And we want to see those ratios in in a good place um and if if they aren't if they aren't where we want them to be then you you have to dive into it a little bit deeper with with the sales maybe they need a little help with closing maybe they need a little help with pushing the tour um maybe they need a little help with just framing the conversation better um, or potentially they're let's say they're they're getting a lot of leads they're getting a lot of people out to the club but they're not closing potentially an issue is, hey, the, the price is just too expensive and that's the primary feedback that they're getting. Or maybe they didn't love the, the golf course as much as they thought they would. So you have to dive into every aspect, um, but having, having the CRM system and being able to track that data to say, all right, I'm looking at, at this salesperson right here and they have a solid lead to tour ratio and a solid tour to close ratio, they're probably in a pretty good spot. Um, so super quick things like that, just tracking on a regular basis, it's going to give you an idea of what's going well and what isn't. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I'm, I'm very curious there. You talked about data from tour to close or lead to tour. How do you guys decide, you know, what that threshold becomes, right? Like if you said, Hey, our tour to close percentage is this, how do you come up with that specific percentage? Yeah, so we we go back through all of our historical data, what we see on average at every single club, um, and it it paints a a pretty simple picture. Uh, to be honest, you know <laughs> what what we see overall from I, I would say from lead to to close, so new inquiry to close, it's usually going to be in the ten to fifteen percent range. If it's somewhere in that range, then you're probably in a comfortable spot. Um, and, and you have a really solid salesperson in there and, and the club is also solid and they're doing everything that they need to do on their end. Um, what we see on the tour to close ratio, at, at least for us as a company with our salespeople, it's going to be somewhere in that 40 to 50% range. So for every, you know, for every 10 uh, tours that you have, you're likely to get at least four or five sales out of those 10 tours. So then we can say and look at that data hey you need so let's just say you need to sell 10 memberships this month that means you probably have to have at least 20 to 25 tours to sell 10 memberships um so you can you can look at that keep it really simple and be able to say all right this is what's going well this is what maybe isn't going as well and we can make some tweaks here and there and, and get it to the place that we want it to be yeah and i think that you know, harkens back to our last podcast about CRM, right? If, if you can't track any of this stuff, how can you ever really even talk about your process and rate it? You know, if you don't know all these numbers, it's really hard to rate your process other than on gut feeling. And we talk about this all the time. Gut feeling doesn't always work in this, right? And in more times than not, it doesn't, you know? And so that's such an important piece to have that data, be able to put that data down on paper, you know, or in a computer and really analyze it and then match it up. And like you said, create these percentages and then kind of rank yourself against it and see where you're at. And like Tyler said, and as we start off that, that is what an honest assessment is, right? Having those numbers, you know, there's, there's no emotion in it. It's pure numbers. And like, do we stack up or not? And then the ability to say, all right, we're not stacking up. Here's what we have to change X, Y, and Z in the process. So I think that was a, a really good answer, Greg. And I think really reading into that, you know, you dropped a couple of numbers there. If you're smart and you start doing some math, you can probably figure out a lot of things for your club, you know, off that comment alone. So Kyle, I want, um, Kyle, I want to interject oh, sorry, real quickly as well. I think, yeah. again, as we look at this, it's, this is not just harping on the salesperson of the process. 
you know, when you look at a secret shop of say your competitors in your area, um, yeah, that is such a key component as well. When you think about, you know, is your club even properly positioned? Is it set up for success based on even just the offering? So when, yeah. and again, knowing your competitors and what they have to offer and what they, you know, what their amenities are and what their price points are, the more knowledgeable a sales director can be firsthand and making sure that a member owned club, that the board has confidence that they're priced properly. Again, you see to chop the five or six other clubs in your immediate area. Um, you're going to learn about if they're on a wait list. You're going to learn about if they have upcoming renovations or assessments. Uh, if they recently lost their greens, uh, what categories they have in terms of membership offering that might be available, the benefits of those. So in terms of just another, again, totally separate area of secret shopping and, and kind of a little bit in a competitive market analysis um, you know, lens, you need to make sure your club is also positioned properly to be successful. You know, if you are the highest priced dues club, but your amenities don't match that compared to your competitors, that's something that you need to be mindful of. You know, your salesperson is probably yep. going to get burnt out or be hitting some walls <laughs> more often than not. So, again, from a very objective standpoint, you know, having an honest assessment of your salesperson, and your sales process, that's very important. I think it's equally important to also understand where you're positioned in the marketplace and is that actually where you're supposed to be. Yeah, and I think a great example of that, I was speaking with um, one of our clubs that uses Drive, so they have their own sales director. Um, and we were talking one day and me and her were discussing another club that's near them that is not private. And I just started asking her a little bit and you could tell that she had secret shop and learned about other clubs. I said, well, how many rounds do they do a year? She goes, oh, they're so busy. I said, man, that's a great sales point. You know, come to this club because you know, the T-sheet's a lot less compacted. And she said she started using that and that's worked a lot more. And that's just part of knowing the clubs around you, right? If she didn't know anything about that other club, it wouldn't have mattered, right? She could never talk about that. But now she can talk to prospective members about, hey, like when you come to this club, you can get on the course, you know, at Saturday morning at 9 a.m. or something like that. Or, you know, you can book within a couple of days, not, hey, you got to book a week out. Yep. Yeah. And it's going to be a six hour round for any, and you're going to be kind of miserable while you're playing, right? For any of those membership sales directors listening, you know, again, I know when I was sitting in that seat, I wanted to have every bit of information I possibly could on the market so that if yeah. Mr. and Mrs. Smith told me they need to go check out you know, X, Y, and Z country club before they make their decision, I can again fall back on the rapport I've built, the timeliness I, I've shown the organization, but also my knowledge of the local industry and say, hey, you know what, that, yeah. that club doesn't have a beach club. And I know you mentioned that for your wife and, and kids, that's really, really important. And again, that's not yeah. dissing that other club. That's giving them the knowledge that they need to say, oh, we don't even need to go see it then. We are ready to join. So you know, again, having that proper preparation to know what the market is, what your competitors are at, their price points, and be able to speak knowledgeably and not in a bashful manner about it can, again, shorten your timeline, which every salesperson out there is always looking for those those little tricks. Yeah, and back to just what Greg was saying, you knew to push the beach club in that instance, not only because you had it and the other club didn't, but because you had developed that relationship and rapport and knew it was important to that, you know, that prospect. So that's another great point. And, and I love how all this ties in, right? This ties in with our last couple episodes with CRM and way back with our third episode where we talked purely about this secret shop data. So uh, all very good points. Um, you know, the other thing we talked about was benchmarks, Tyler. And this is something I'm not as strong at because obviously I'm, 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 I'm a little newer to capstone in the industry than you guys, but what is benchmarks or what is benchmarking and, and why is that useful to a, a membership sales director? Yeah, I think again, we've, we've briefly touched on this in other um, parts of this, this conversation so far, but again, just knowing, you know, where you stack up compared to industry averages, industry standards. Um, you know, it's very important and, and insightful to understand, like, again, if you're getting, the ample number of tours that you need out to the club, but you're not closing them, you know, compared to the industry average that we see, um, that is obviously a, a red flag. That is an area that needs further, you know, reviewing and, and work towards, so additional training. Um, so, you know, that's one example of just understanding if you have the data necessary to know what those benchmarks are, you can then use that to your advantage to find areas to continue to improve. So Tyler, if I'm a membership sales director and I'm out there and I'm looking for some of these benchmark standards to compare myself against, how do I find them? You know, is it a Google thing? Can I call you? Like, what do I do? 
Yeah, it's a great question, Kyle. Um, and we've gotten that asked before. So really the best way to gain access to that type of data uh, would be becoming a, a part of our drive program. Uh, so our drive program, again, is an all encompassing CRM system specifically built for membership sales directors at private clubs. Uh, it's turnkey. There's very little uh, load in time to be able to get all of your club information and your existing pipeline into there. But it provides you those extra tools like the benchmarking standards. Um, nowhere else out there is going to have the ability to understand what is taking that, you know, that timeline for a membership sales director at private clubs like we do. Um, and there is countless other resources that come with that, like training, not only on the CRM system, but the foundational pieces that we continue to harp about uh, week in and week out on these podcasts. So, yes, our Capstone Drive program is a perfect area uh, to not only gain access to that, but many other benefits that will help increase your sales. It's a good good thing to know uh, if you're out there listening. So if you, you got any questions on that, you can visit our website and just do backslash drive dash info. So it'd be capstone dash hospitality.com backslash drive dash info. So Tyler, Greg, thanks for joining me today and talking about, you know, this honest assessment and assessing your sales process and salesperson. I think it's very enlightening. And, you know, obviously we'll come back and we talk about topics every week, but this was such an important piece that I know we do day in and day out and, you know, really throughout clubs all across the country. So we've seen it, we've done East coast, you know, we do the Midwest, we even have uh, some clubs out on the West coast. So do you guys have any part in words or, or any other thing that we should add to this conversation before signing off? I mean, the only thing I was going to say is I would just encourage clubs to do it. You know, it's one of those things that you, you, you can't just trust your gut on, Hey, we've got a, a good salesperson, a good sales process. And every time you do it, you're going to find something that can be improved or some, Something to you know, build your confidence off of that's already you're doing well. So, yeah, and I think a, a point that Tyler made very quickly in in this segment um, was, you know, why are you only looking at things when they are going well, right? Or why are you only looking at things if they're not going well? Um, you should be you should be very diligent in the sales assessment process whether it's secret shopping or just on a regular basis, looking into what is that salesperson's process? What are their follow-ups like? What is their conversation like um, that they have with the prospects? So you have to be doing that on a consistent basis because I, I know personally, and I'm sure Tyler feels this way as well, even if you have been doing this for five years, 10 years, 15 years, there's going to be times where maybe there there's a little bit of a lapse and maybe you change up your process and don't even realize it. Um, and, and something may get in the way of you being successful. So no matter, no matter how long you've been doing this, no matter whether you're doing well or not doing well, it just be very diligent with the assessment process. And, um, that, that will go a long way. Yeah, Greg, I think that was a great point uh, for me, Greg and Tyler. We appreciate everyone listening in. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Literally, our emails are our name at capstone-hospitality.com. So that's either Greg, Tyler or Kyle at capstone-hospitality.com if you have any other questions with that. Uh, Greg and Tyler, thanks for joining me today. I appreciate you guys coming out as always, and I will see you next week. Thanks, gentlemen. Thanks, guys. Thank you.